Welcome once more to the Design Materials channel. I am Edson Mafus, architect and professor of architectural design at the School of Architecture, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, Brazil. I'm back with another video on architectural design. This time to talk about a trio of buildings built by James Sterling in England between 1959 and 1971. In addition to being important in the architect's career, as they established his international reputation and provided him with opportunities to build in other countries, these buildings demonstrate the evolution of modern architecture. It is well known that many critics stated that modern architecture had reached its peak before the Second War and that it was, by the middle of last century, in serious decline. In these buildings, Sterling combines modernist criteria, such as the articulation of programmatic volumes, inherited from academic elementary composition, with aspects of vernacular English architecture, both domestic and industrial, and with a visible concern for relating his projects to their surroundings. This set of buildings received the nickname Red Trilogy for using traditional materials like red brick and ceramic tiles of the same color, besides being built in succession for English universities. <clears throat> the first element of the trilogy is the Faculty of Engineering for the University of Leicester, carried out in partnership with James Gowan. The building is located at one end of the campus, directly opposite one of the corners of Victoria Park. This campus consists of low-rise buildings of no more than three floors. The School of Engineering, Engineering Building was the first to overcome this height limit. The site plan reveals that the site has no regular shape and that its size was not sufficient to house the program in a building with few floors. The need to create a surface parking area has further reduced the usable surface. This all led to a solution that combines a rectangular pavilion where the large testing laboratory is located and a tower that adopts the geometry of the site on the side facing the park. Here Perhaps the most striking feature of the building is the fact that the, the roof of the large laboratory is turned at an angle in relation to the predominant geometry of the building. The reason for this is that the, these labs should receive light only from the north. They didn't want to get sunlight, but they, they wanted just the light, just the illumination, not the rays of sun. Two views showing the volumetric articulation of the tower. Here each component of the program is housed in an individual volume, a compositional strategy Sterling called expressive functionalism. This is made very explicit in the sketch on the right, where all the, the programmatic volumes are separated. And this explains the what is what. For instance, the labs are in blue, yellow, light yellow, the offices, dark yellow, the lecture theaters, the circulation in red, public spaces in green, and workshops in purple. Here you see the, the, 
the placing, the places where the main materials are. On the left, where the, the red skin is, made out of bricks and ceramic tiles, and on the right, where the, the glass skin is placed. And this appears clearly in this photograph. In this one, we can see the, the two main entrances, the, the entrance in between the tower and the labs on the right at the bottom of the picture. And it's not very easy to see, but on the, on the left of this podium, brick podium, we can see the beginning of the ramp, which takes people to the level of the top entrance. Here we see the other side, and here one of the, the interesting features is that is this kind of different windows that they created for the, the small labs. The window is at an angle, which makes possible to have a horizontal part of the window at the same level of the sill, and this horizontal part can be open and can admit air into the labs. The plans. In the plans we see the entrances on the left, the, the entrances I was referring to just as a minute ago, the, the entrance on the ground floor and the entrance through the, through the, the ramp, which takes people to the level of the plan on the top left. Three sections. This one sectioning the building exactly where the small conference room is, and it shows to the the small labs with the the triangular windows. We can also see that the 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 lab, this big space covered by by the roof, the glass roof, has by the road a three-story part. And the top level of this part overhangs the sidewalk, with making it possible for objects to be lowered and raised through a kind of trapdoor. Here we see a section through the circulation. And one of the things we see here is that the, the, the section is becomes smaller as it goes up. More or less similar to what happened in happens in Cambridge, as we we will see shortly. And this next one goes through the main conference room and the offices. The offices which are on the the taller <coughs> volume. <coughs> Here, <coughs> sorry, a detail showing the, the roof of the labs. And one characteristic of this roof is that the, the south facing glazing has, it, it is, is not a single sheet of glazing but a sandwich kind of thing with two sheets of glass with a sheet of aluminum between them. What we see here in the picture on the on the right is the non-transparent part of the roof. And here we see the same space in use but facing the north which is the which is where the the light comes from. The second building of the trilogy is the history faculty at Cambridge University, designed and built from 64 to 67. A general view makes clear the importance of the reading room in the building's program. And unlike what happens in Leicester, where despite the size of the labs, 
there is a certain balance between the parts of the program here. The axonometric shows that the procedure adopted here is also that of composition by parts, in which the parts of the program appear articulated volumetrically. The reading room is like a glass tent, sheltered or supported by an L-shaped volume, also made of glass, where the offices and classrooms are located. Also noteworthy is the bookshelf sector, a low body that follows the shape of the reading room, the circulation towers, which are similar to those in Leicester, in a multiple-use room next to those towers. After the competition, the size of the site was reduced by half, forcing the orientation of the building to be changed. This resulted in the southeast orientation of the reading room, which may have influenced the poor performance of its roof. For several years the building was in danger of demolition, mainly because no one had ever been able to solve the heating problems and leaks in the glass roof. On the left we can see the panoptic organization scheme of the library as well as its excesses. The, when I say panoptic, I refer to a kind of organization that allows the supervision of a large area in a building from a single point of view. This means a kind of radial concentric disposition such as the case here the 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 reading room is like uh, has the shape of a, a quarter circle and from the square space in the middle from where those those uh, lines emerge one can see what's going on between the shelves at this period england was going through a problem whereby uh, books and magazines were being stolen and damaged in libraries. So they needed a system that allowed them to supervise what was going on in a library. And this resulted in this. The panoptic scheme had been invented in the 19th century, especially for hospitals, psychi psychiatrical hospitals and other hospitals, for uh, prisons, and even for schools. So on the left we see the plan in, in which this characteristic is very uh, apparent and on the top we see uh, an axonometric showing exactly this in 3D and we see that the, the shelves area has two stories. On the right we have two sections and from then we take Three, three features of the building. One of them is that the section decreases in depth as it goes up because the, the larger spaces are at the bottom, the smaller ones, the offices, are at the top. This is one thing. The other thing is that from the circulation on these floors we can see inside the reading room as it's clear in the top section. And the third point has to do with the with the construction of the the big roof of the library. The complexity of this roof based on metal beams with glass above and below and air extractors between these two layers in order to minimize the the heating the possible heating of the space. Here we see the plans, the plans of the building <coughs> with the bottom floor at the bottom left of the of the of the screen in which we see basically the library spaces. Above it we see a plan in which the top 
shelf level appears and the, the larger spaces for the school. And on the right column we see the other plans with the, the decreasing footprint of the plans in the L-shaped part of the, the complex. Here we can see how the building is basically, or the main facades are made of steel using the, the century-long experience that the English have with this sort of technology. The, the bricks appear in the side walls and in the, the circulation towers. In this view, we can see quite clearly the decreasing section in the L-shaped part of the building. Two of the entrances. At the bottom, the entrance directly to the library. Through the ramp, the entrance to the offices and other educational spaces. Here, a series of views of the reading room which is the kind of heart of the building. Here we see what was mentioned before about the, the possibility of controlling the whole space from the, that counter at the very center of the picture, that which has a column, uh, a mushroom column in it. And another thing which can be seen here is that that in the corridors above, they all open onto the library, but in the corridors there are these, these uh, small spaces that advance from the level of the wall, which, uh, which are kind of niches that allow people to sit there and talk uh, and while looking down. Here from the side, from the top floor, of the library where shelves can be found. From underneath that area and the last image is the point where this kind of tent encounters the, the corner of the L-shaped building. The third building of the trilogy is the Flore building built for the Queen's College. There are two main differences between the Flory and the two other buildings analyzed here. In the first place, it's not an academic building, but a dormitory. Secondly, although as a part of a college, it was built far away from it across the river Cherwell. The building contains 73 individual rooms for undergraduate students, five for researchers, and an apartment for a senior researcher. The rooms are developed on four levels, the last two being occupied by double height studies. Here you can see the distance between the college and the dormitory, and also the fact that it is located on the edge of a small river. In this view, we see at the top, as the, the dormitories try to face the college. And on the plan, we see the dorms at the bottom right and the college at the top left. So there is quite a, dif di a distance between them, although one can see the other from that distance. The composition by parts is not so evident here as it was in the two previous buildings, perhaps because the program is much simpler. It is much more evident that the desire to create a patio an essential element of the existing colleges, and this patio faces the river and Queen's College. The patio has the shape of an incomplete polygon, 
whose distortions have to do with the accommodation to the terrain and the fitting of the access system. The planning for the area included a riverside walk that would go past all buildings to be built there. However, the only stretch actually built is the one in front of Sterling's building. In addition to the definition of a semi-open courtyard, another fundamental decision was to set each floor of the building back in order to improve the angle of penetration of the sun in the patio. This is clearly shown in the section on the top left. This forced the abandonment of a vertical and orthogonal bearing structure for one that included several diagonal members to counter the tendency of the building's body to fall back. This diagonal structure is illustrated on the section on the right by the yellow color. Axonometric drawings was one of the preferred ways for Sterling to represent his projects. The one on the left shows the structure very well and resembles similar drawings by Auguste Choisy, as both reveal an interest in the constructional aspects of buildings. The top view clearly shows the staggering of the, of the upper floors and the relationship to the river. The basement plans shows that there is a base, a breakfast room aligned with the structure and with a fountain which was located above it. On the ground floor, there is a wall that does not reach the ceiling and separates the external parking for cars from the internal parking for bicycles. On the right, on the plan, we see the, the access control by the, the towers and the caretaker's house. On the left, there is an access hall to the breakfast room. Here we see the top floors in which I see that they recede as they go up and that there is a, a strip of service in the outer perimeter. The, the inner perimeter of, of the courtyard is occupied by the, the living rooms, by the apartments, and the outer part is occupied by a series of spaces like bathrooms, small kitchens, wardrobes, the corridor proper, and it's interesting to see that every time the corridor changes directions in that corner, that open corner, there is a, a, an empty space which was meant to be used uh, for a, a living space. Places for the students to gather. A series of views of the, of the courtyard and one thing which is very evident in this picture and in the next pictures is that there is a, a system for cleaning the windows there are those, those ladders that you see on the right of the building that can run over a rail and make it easier for people to clean, to clean the windows. It, it's something like a mechanism that, uh, in general, uh, Sterling puts in his buildings. Not the same, but with the same purpose. The other thing is that all the, the glass is protected from the inside by heavy curtains. Here we see also the courtyard and the, the, this kind of cloister which goes around it, a view from the outside, from the walk, the river walk, which was not continued by other buildings. Here we see the breakfast room, access to the courtyard, a view from one of the 
one of the rooms, an elevated view over the courtyard, and a view from the other side of the river, showing the whole thing. Outside views, in this case we see the two circulation towers, the main entrance, the way they relate to the building, which is inclined. Here the connection through a bridge, to a glazed bridge that gives access to the main body of the building. Underneath this bridge is the main entrance with the control to the right and the caretaker's apartment also to the right. <coughs> the external parking, the internal parking around the cloister. And finally, a view that shows the emergency stairs that stick out from the building because of the angle of the walls. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you come back for more. And do not forget to subscribe to be informed of the next videos. Thank you very much.